We're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Book Passage. My name is Johanna Ruth, your host tonight, and I'd like to thank you for coming in to your locally owned and operated local bookstore. Um, your presence here is what makes Book Passage a rich cultural center, and it's our privilege to bring world-class writers into conversation with our community, so thank you. Today, Book Passage is very proud to bring you award-winning author Jennifer Dubois. Jennifer's work has been published in a wide variety of noted periodicals, and her debut novel, A Partial History of Lost Causes, won the California Book Award for First Fiction and was a Book Passage First Editions pick of 2012. Jennifer is with us today to talk about her stunningly crafted second book entitled Cartwheel, a novel. This ambitious, stunningly crafted thriller brilliantly explores the prism of perspective. Justin Torres, New York Times bestselling author of We the Animals, writes, Cartwheel is so gripping, so fantastically evocative, that I could not, would not, put it down. Jennifer Dubois is a writer of thrilling psychological precision. She dares to not pause a moment, digging into the mess of crime and accusation, culture and personality, the known and the unknown, and coming up with a sensational novel of profound depth. Please join the passage in warmly welcoming Jennifer Dubois. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the vast number of members of the public who have <laughs> to join us this evening. Um, I will read um, just maybe a little bit from the very beginning of the book, and then um, depending on how we're doing on time, maybe a little bit from chapter two as well. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Um, so I'll just start at the very beginning, so if there's no no introduction or setup necessary here. Chapter one. Andrew's plant plane landed at Easy E as promised at 7 a.m. local time. Outside the window, the sun was a hideous orb of bleeding orange light through wavering heat. Andrew was still woozy from his two Valiums and two glasses of wine, the bare minimum that he needed to fly these days to anywhere for anything though especially for here, for this. The irony of being a professor of international relations who was terrified of international travel was not lost on him. No irony was lost on him ever, but it could not be helped. Neither could it be mitigated by the knowledge, always understood, but now finally believed, that the things that go wrong are rarely the things you thought to worry about. Andrew patted Anna on the shoulder and she roused herself. He watched her forget and then remember what was happening. He was glad he didn't have to remind her. She pulled her iPod headphones out of her ears and Andrew caught snatches of some ambient, low-key music. The music of the day was so bloodless, he often thought. Didn't these kids want anything and weren't they mad at anybody? Before she thumbed it quiet. Andrew, Anna had endured the trip reasonably well. Her sensible hair was limp in a ponytail. Her nautical stripes, so favored by his students these days, were barely creased. She wore her competence lightly. She didn't know how terrifying it was to him. Dad, she said, you need to blink. Andrew blinked painfully. Does your corneal abrasion hurt, she said. No, he said. It always hurt. He had poked himself in the eye during class one day while making a particularly vigorous point about Russian cyber terrorism in Estonia, and he'd had to go to the ER for a local eyeball anesthetic. Now his eye hurt every morning, every flight, every time he was tired or stressed, which he always would be now for the foreseeable future. Will we see Lily today, said Anna. Andrew licked his lips. His eyeballs were so dry that he thought they might tear. The Argentina flights from the East Coast went only once a day and only from DC, and it was impossible to get to DC in less than seven hours, no matter how you looked at it. Andrew could not, he reminded himself, have gotten here any earlier. Probably not today, he said. Will mom see her when she comes? Hopefully. Andrew's voice cracked and Anna looked at him, alarmed. Hopefully, he said again, to show her that the crack had been fatigue, not emotion. Outside, it was summer, as Andrew had known, but secretly not entirely believed that it would be. 
Anna shimmied out of her jacket, her nose crinkling at the smell of gasoline. Inside the airport, the terminal thrummed with travelers. Andrew offered to buy Anna a soda, then rescinded this offer when he spotted the newspaper outside the kiosk. He didn't have much Spanish beyond what one absorbed through cultural osmosis and a general familiarity with Latinate words, but it was uncomfortably easy to get the gist of the headlines, whether he wanted to or not. Andrew wished desperately to keep Anna away from the newspapers. She knew the contours of the accusation, of course, but Andrew had managed, or thought he had managed, to protect her from the worst of it. The coverage was only just beginning to leak over to the United States anyway, and Andrew had spent long hours on the internet looking for the stories, the depictions of Lily as hypersexual, unstable, amoral, the lurid intimations about her romantic jealousy and rage, the accounts of her smug and towering atheism. The fact that she hadn't cried, not after Katie was killed, and not during the interrogations either. The internet had harped on this so much that Andrew had found himself shouting, she's not a crier, she's just not a fucking crier, into the computer. And finally, the worst, most militantly misunderstood information of all. The fact that a delivery truck driver had seen Lily running from the house with blood on her face the day after the murder. No matter that she'd been the one to find Katie, no matter that she'd been the one to kneel over her and try to administer brave and futile CPR. The news reports were bothering with that information, and Andrew didn't expect them to start. He was beginning to understand what story they were trying to tell. Announcing that the sodas would be better outside the airport, Andrew maneuvered Anna, rather deftly, he thought, to her baggage claim, where they waited for 15 minutes in silence. In wrestling the suitcase off the conveyor belt, Andrew accidentally stomped on the foot of an androgynous teenager. Permiso, he muttered to the teenager, who was wearing a t-shirt that said, sorry for partying. Beside him, Andrew could feel Anna stiffen. Andrew liked to at least know how to apologize wherever he went, but Anna hated it when he tried to speak any language other than English. Two summers ago, in a different lifetime, Andrew had spent three months doing research in Bratislava. His area was emerging post-Soviet democracies, though his job got a little less interesting the more fully the democracies emerged. And afterward, the girls had met him in Prague for a week of castles and bridges and beer. Anna had flinched every time he opened his mouth to deploy some phrase he remembered from his three semesters of college, Czech. Dad, she said, they speak English. Well, I speak Czech. No, you don't. It's polite to address people in the local language. No, it's not. And so on. Lily, on the other hand, had made him teach her as much Czech as he could, and had then thrown it around willy-nilly, mispronounced, absurd, chirping informal greetings of storekeepers who tended to smile at her even though she was basically insulting them because she was so obviously well-intentioned. Andrew used to imagine that Lily's general goodwill, the buoyancy with which she addressed her life, was easily detectable by all people of the world and that it would protect her. It seemed now that this was not the case. In the taxi, Andrew and Anna passed fruit stands, dingy-looking bars, backfiring motorcycles. Through the hazy heat, Andrew saw barrios with squat, intersecting systems of housing. Clotheslines shimmering with brightly colored clothes, the occasional corrugated tin roof winking astral bright in the sun. The roads were medium good, the infrastructure in general seemed decent. Out the window, Andrew saw satellite dishes wedged improbably between houses, looking like the detritus of abandoned spaceships. He saw a large compound, walled and razor-wired, manned by two security guards with walkie-talkies. He craned his neck to see if it was the prison, but it turned out to only be a housing development. Nothing's open, said Anna. She was looking out her own window and did not turn around. It's Sunday, said Andrew, very Catholic country. It's too bad that Latin America is in your area. Andrew stared at the back of Anna's head. She had lately taken to making inscrutable declarative statements and steady neutral tones. Andrew desperately hoped that this was not the onset, onset of irony. You might get some work done, I mean, she said. I don't know about that. Andrew was suddenly nauseous, awash with their strange new calamity. There was, of course, no possibility that Lily had actually been involved in any of this. Andrew's confidence on that point was part of what had made the, made the situation seem initially not catastrophic. The accusation was so ghastly and so wild and so patently, transparently ludicrous that he nearly laughed when he first heard of it. Not that there weren't a few things he could imagine Lily getting justly arrested for. Before she had left, he and Maureen had had a series of sober conversations with her about the harshness of Latin American drug laws mostly, as well as the laxity of Latin American sexual safety standards. They had sent her off with an enormous box of Trojans, 
Industrial size, Andrew thought, issued for health clinics or music festivals, no doubt. A box that size could not possibly be intended for the use of a single human being. Andrew reeled to think of how much sex his daughter would have to have to run through all of them. Nevertheless, he had bravely and maturely had the conversation alongside Maureen. Such was their commitment to pragmatism, such was their commitment to co-parenting, and then bravely and maturely sent Lily off with the box. And Andrew had worried about Lily constantly. He worried about her being kidnapped, trafficked, impregnated, sexually assaulted, afflicted, afflicted with some horrible STD, arrested for marijuana use, converted to Catholicism, wooed by a long-lashed man with a Vespa. He worried she'd make too few friends, then he worried she'd make too many. He worried that her GPA would suffer. He worried about her bug bites. He worried so much that when there came a call from Maureen on his walk work phone in the middle of the day, her voicemail left in a strangled half-whisper. Andrew could taste metal in his mouth, so certain was he that something life-altering had happened. And when he heard Lily was in jail, his mind flooded with grim visions of drug use and anti-Americanism and political points to be scored. He could imagine how she looked to everyone, naive and entitled, no doubt, and he could e easily imagine the incentive for punishing her harshly. So when the accusation turned out to be not drugs, not drugs or fair jumping on the metro, did Buenos Aires even have a metro? Or trespassing through someone's field while looking at the stars, or any one of the countless thoughtless crimes that he could believe his daughter might have committed, Andrew was mostly relieved. An accusation of murder was outrageous to the point of being comic, and thus was no great threat. Andrew had tried to communicate some of this feeling to Lily on the telephone when she finally, finally been allowed to call. Don't worry, he had said over the terrible connection. It seemed absolutely vital that Lily know she did not have to tell them she had not done it. Her innocence and eventual acquittal must be the unspoken premises of all their interactions, to be referenced in passing perhaps, but never formally declared. I know, he'd said, we all know. Mordantly, from a great distance, she'd said, you know what? Um, so maybe I'll just read um, a couple of pages from the first section of um, chapter two. So um, we've heard from a character who's very convinced of Lily's innocence, and now we'll hear from a character who is quite convinced of her guilt. So this is Eduardo who's the prosecutor in the case. Eduardo Campos was not sure until he saw the pictures. Later, people would ask him informally, socially, when he knew. Be honest with us, they'd say, we won't tell. We knew when we heard about her Facebook page. We knew when we heard about her cartwheel. We knew when we saw the footage of her with the condoms, that cold, seductive look she gave the boy, and only hours after that poor other girl was knifed to death. That's when we knew Lily Hayes was guilty. When did you know? And Eduardo would laugh and say that of course he never knew, that he still didn't know. His job was just to make the case for the state, and the state's case, one had to admit, was ironclad. But the truth was he did know, and he had first known when the judi judicial police brought him Lily Hayes' camera. The crime scene had not surprised him. Nothing surprised him, really though there was certainly an incongruity between the upscale neighborhood and the well-kept house and the young American woman dead in a vast swamp of her own blood. It had taken Eduardo years to get used to how much blood one body could produce, but he was used to it now and he studied the scene with his practiced dissociative attitude, reminding himself that the best way to help this young woman now was to pay very close attention. She was lying on her stomach with her face to the side punched in the characteristic awkwardness of the dead. There was substantial bruising along her inner thighs. It was overwhelmingly likely that she had been sexually assaulted. Eduardo followed the police with his notepad. He did not touch anything. In the kitchen, they found a knife, which was collected. In the victim's drawer, they found a half-empty packet of skin-skin condoms, which was also collected. In the bathroom, they found three discreet spots of blood and an unflushed toilet, all of which were photographed, then sampled. In the garden, they found Lily Hayes, who had discovered the body, according to her, moments before running across the lawn with blood on her face, according to the driver, who was now shakily smoking a cigarette in front of his delivery truck. Lily Hayes was white, late teens or early twenties, with a squarish jaw and auburn hair, and high, vaguely witchy eyebrows. She appeared to have already washed all of the blood off her face. She was standing morosely next to a very young man in suspenders. 
Behind them, the bald, double pates of San Telmo Pedro gleamed in the distance. Lily Hayes was not crying. She was pale, but perhaps she was always pale. She kissed the boy once, somewhat chastely, and then again, a little less chastely. She looked, Eduardo decided, harassed, inconvenienced, if she looked anything at all. There was a stillness to her face that would probably seem perverse under any circumstances, but especially these circumstances, and which could only be intentional. Eduardo let himself think the thought, and then he let it pass. He'd been at this long enough to know that you couldn't scour yourself entirely clean of hunches and biases and premonitions, lurking suspicions, knee-jerk reactions. You couldn't help but know some things without knowing why you knew them. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just maybe, I, I was going to read a longer scene, but I think maybe I'll just read a couple of um, paragraphs from just the very end of this chapter. Okay. On Friday, the police brought in Lily Hayes' camera, and finally, Eduardo was sure. Everything he really needed to know was in the pictures. In the pictures, the ease with which Lily Hayes floated through the universe was ruinously apparent. There simply was not a bit of friction between her desires and their arrival. Arise, world, she seemed to say. Part seas. Reveal yourself, Buenos Aires, and let me take your picture. On the camera was a woman, a picture of a woman with a blood-colored lesion on her face, clearly taken on the sly. There was a picture of a tiny pantsless boy. There was a picture of Lily Hayes herself giving an exaggerated thumbs up as she points to her bug bites. Here, Eduardo saw was a person without humility. And Eduardo believed that humility, more than anything, was the basis for morality. Goodness begins when the Buberian I-it shifts to the ethically accountable I-thou it begins with the belief that you do not have a monopoly on consciousness, that you are not, in fact, the only person who exists. And here's Lily Hayes, standing in front of the basilica, her, her prodigious bosom spilling out over a too tight tank top. She is nearly aglow with the light of her narcissism. Does she notice that all of the other women are modestly dressed, that their heads are covered? She either does not notice or she does not care. A person who does not notice is silly. A person who does not care is dangerous. And when Eduardo looked at Lily Hayes' photos, he could see which kind of person she was. For whatever other qualities she had, Lily Hayes was not unobservant. She noticed everything. The pictures attested to this. Here she is noticing the wings of a dragonfly, and here she is noticing the dew on a guava fruit, and here she is noticing the hilarious discrepancy between an enormous sign advertising Comida Vegetariana alongside the butchered hide of some unfortunate ungulant glistening in the sun. What Lily noticed was gratingly predictable, perhaps, but she did notice. So Eduardo had to conclude, tentatively, of course, that what she didn't do was care. That afternoon, Eduardo submitted his request to schedule the hearing before the instructor judge. He felt he had enough to say. Thank you.